Good morning, everybody. I am looking forward to that time when I can <coughs> speak to you from down there and I don't feel quite so far away, but <laughs> health unit rules. Um, like we said last week, they changed the rules on us, so they want us to keep masks on the whole service. Ruth and I can get away with it because we are 12 feet away from you. So nobody sit in the front row. Not that you're all rushing to the front row anyway. But so glad you're here. Let's pray. Father, thank you for watching over us. Thank you for keeping us safe, for keeping our loved ones safe, and for bringing us here this morning. We know that you have a plan and purpose for our lives, and uh, you, through, the, through the everyday routine stuff and through the special things that happen in our lives. And, and this morning, we um, make it a part of our routine to come here and fellowship together in, as a family on Sunday morning. And so we pray, Lord, that your spirit would work in this routine time that we have, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would comfort us, you would challenge us, that, um, that your word would come alive in our hearts and minds, and that we would leave this place different, in some ways different from the way we came in. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I love that song because it asks questions. It says, I don't know why, I don't know how, I don't know when, but I do know who. Wonderful song. We're going to spend some time this morning um, in Lectio Divina, which we've done a few times before. And uh, Lectio Divina is just a way of reading scripture together and then taking a few moments to consider it individually in our hearts and in our minds. Uh, there are sort of four stages. There's read, when we will read together the verse that will be on the screen. There's uh, reflect, when I will read just excerpts from that passage and just pause for a moment while we each listen to our hearts and listen to our minds and look for what it is that God has for us in these scriptures. There is uh, a moment of response when we will sit in silence and absorb the things that God has been reading into us. And there is the, the passage of uh, receive, the moment of receiving it when uh, I'll just close in prayer and thank God for what he's had to say to us this morning. So the passage that we're going to be contemplating this morning will be on the screen. So let's read that together. Read this with me. I want to make known to you the gospel I proclaimed to you. You received it and have taken your stand on it. You are also saved by it. If you hold all the message that I proclaimed to you, for I passed on to you as of first importance what was passed on to me, <clears> that <throat> Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. So our next section is reflect. So uh, I will just read some phrases from these scripture passages. Sit still. Let your mind be still. Let your body be still. Let your heart become still and hear what God has to say to you. You can close your eyes, you can keep them open, whatever you're comfortable with. But uh, let's take some time to hear what God has to say to us through this scripture. You have <clears throat> received the gospel. gospel is of first importance. The 
I want to pass on the gospel. It is of first importance that Christ died for our sins. It is of first importance that Christ was raised again. I want to share with you that which is of first importance. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was raised again according to the scriptures. Now let's take a bit of time to just sit in silence and talk to God about what his word says to us. Heavenly Father, gracious Son, Holy Spirit, we receive what you have spoken to us today. We receive what you say to us through these written words preserved through time. We receive what Christ did for us so long ago and every day. We receive what the Spirit has to say to us and to build in us and to do in us. We thank you that you have given us the gospel, the knowledge that Christ died for our sins, that he was raised again, and that this was all done according to your word in the scriptures. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Revelation chapter 21. Starting to read at verse 1. Revelation 21, starting to read at verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. 
There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, I, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, the, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Father, we pray that your word would touch our hearts. The stories of your people would touch our hearts. And that we would see things perhaps like we've never seen them before. Lord, please give me the strength to do this. Take this time as yours. Do whatever you'd like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. Through most of the pandemic, there have been two scripture verses that have been on our sign outside the church. One says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I think that was my idea. The other, I think, was Gary's idea. And it says, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. Now, the second verse uh, is from Revelation 21. We just read that passage. It's the chapter that speaks of the hope of heaven. Verses 3 and 4 read, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or crying or pain. I think I've mentioned in the past that at Campus Church at the University in Oshawa, where I do ministry, we are focusing on our Friday night online gatherings on the issue of suffering. And we've looked at the theology of suffering last, this past Friday, the purpose of suffering. We've looked at God's empathy for us in our suffering. Next week, it's my turn to do the talk again, and the topic is going to be persevering in and through suffering. And as much as I have my experiences in this area, just like everybody else, um, I think sometimes of what some other people will go through, and I wonder, what do I really know about persevering through suffering? We have a guy who comes to campus church, his name's Thomas, and uh, he suffers from a degenerative muscular disease that has left him in a wheelchair. We were chatting one time last year after our Friday night gathering, and he usually is kind of joking around and smiling a lot, but he got uncharacteristically serious with me. He just looked at me and he said, I'm going to die, meaning this disease will eventually kill him. And yet he persevered in getting his diploma from Durham College last year. And I got, I got to be honest, if he shows up Friday, I'm going to feel very small, even trying to talk about persevering and suffering. And over the last couple of days, I've been thinking about three men. Nick, Jonathan, and Steve. Three men who are in my social cir circle. Guys I don't know really well, but two of them are on my Facebook account. I've, I knew them before that. I don't put anybody on my Facebook account that I didn't already know before. And the other one I went to Bible college with. I want to tell you about these three men. Nick is a pastor in Oshawa. He actually performed a wedding here about uh, three years ago. One of his parishioners lives in this area and wanted to use a nice old church like this for, for her wedding. And Nick was her young adults pastor. Nick is one of the pastors who has supported campus church at the university for many, many years, long before I even got involved. But over the last few years, Nick hasn't been as involved in campus church as he used to be. Because he's, he's had to pay, he's had to pare down his activities in ministry in order to care for his wife, Laura, because his wife was stricken with cancer. And it's been a real roller coaster ride for, for the family and for their church. 
Um, she took a turn for the worse about a year ago, then rallied again. They tried some experimental medications on her that are only being used in certain cases, and they seem to, to, to help her rally around and do better. But of it, the cancer eventually continued on its ravaging journey through her body. And the Friday before Labor Day, the day before Pastor Nick was supposed to form, perform the wedding of two other students from Campus Church, Nick's wife, Laura, passed away. When I was in Bible college in Peterborough, I met the Manifold brothers, David and Jonathan Manifold. They were twins uh, who came from an Italian pastor's family in Montreal. And it wasn't long before the entire school was aware of them because they were phenomenal musicians. David played the saxophone and the piano. Jonathan played the bass. And they took part in, in our worship team and worship bands during chapel. They weren't in my close circle of friends, although David was in quite a few of my classes. But we chatted occasionally based on the Montreal connection, especially since my mom was saved in, the, in an Italian church in Montreal. There was a, and we knew some people mutually. There was a connection there. A couple of years ago, I'm at Campus Church doing my thing on Friday night. Someone else is going to come and speak, and Jonathan shows up at Campus Church, and I recognize him, and I'm like, hey, I know you from Bible school. And we had a chance to, to connect after the service. He's now a pastor in Whitby. And one of the, the girls who was a, a leader, a student leader in Campus Church at the time, went to Jonathan's church and asked him to come and be one of the special speakers on our, on our Friday night gathering. And I don't know if it was then in that conversation, or it might have been shortly thereafter on a, a pastor's um, chat or joint email, that I discovered that Jonathan's wife was very sick with cancer. This semester has been really different for us at Campus Church, like Rob said, in terms of first-year university students. This is just totally not what they were expecting. And for us, we've had to connect, do all of our events, all of our gatherings, all of our one-on-one -on -one connections online. The only student I've seen in person since March was this fellow Thomas in the wheelchair. Because I brought him groceries once back in May, and that's the only time I've seen someone in person. But the Lord's been good, and we've had actually about a half a dozen brand new students join us. That was one of our worries, is how are we going to connect with new students? How are we going to do outreach? But we've had six, about six new students, all Christians, who have joined us and joined our studies on Zoom. And one of them is a fellow named Jake, last name Manifo. And so not being a very common name, I asked him, are you related to, to David or Jonathan? He goes, yeah, yeah, Jonathan's my dad. And Jake's a very upbeat young man, and he's jumped right into the campus church community with both feet. I think he inherited his dad's musical ability. If we were meeting in person and doing you know, in-person worship, I think he would be front and center getting involved in that. Ethan's another student at Campus Church. He's a math major from Guelph, and he's living in Durham at the university and a faithful member of Campus Church. And he and I have started an online prayer meeting on Tuesday afternoons where students can come and join us for prayer together. And it, like other prayer meetings other years, it's taking a while to catch on. A few weeks ago, Jake was the only other student who joined us. He came about halfway through our time together and Ethan and I had already just wrapping up discussing the different things we were going to pray about and pray for. So I asked Jake, is there anything we can, we can pray with you and for you about? And he paused, paused briefly and he said, well, my mom passed away Saturday night and I was floored. And my mind raced back to Bible college and I said, you mean Janet? He said, yeah. We spent the next few minutes talking with him and letting him talk, you know, as much or as little as he wanted to. He sounded like he was getting a lot of support from his family and from the church family. He was working on talking to the school, you know, and getting some of his assignments and, and exams deferred so he could have a few weeks to kind of absorb all that was happening in his family and, and the school seemed to be cooperating. He talked about the upcoming funeral and, and how it was going to be very different and limited because of COVID. So Ethan and I prayed with him and for him, and after about 20 minutes of just chatting and praying, Jake had to go, and Ethan and I were left there online together just stunned, but grateful that, that Jake was so open and that we could pray with him. When George Floyd was killed, 
and the issue of racism began to be discussed everywhere, I felt that something that I really needed to do was to talk to friends of mine who were black and hear from them how they were feeling about things, hear what their experiences were and what their experiences are in society. I didn't want this whole situation to be something where I was simply informed by the media who spins things according to however agenda they have on all sides. I wanted to talk to real people. So I started making some appointments. Some people in this church were very kind to give me the time to, to talk with them and allow me to hear their stories. And I connected online with a fellow, um, with a fellow college minister from Windsor and talked to her about her feelings. And after about 25 years of only occasionally seeing this fellow on Facebook, I decided I would connect with Steve. When I lived in Montreal, my young adults group ran a basketball outreach in a working class, predominantly black neighborhood in Montreal called Little Burgundy. And we were a bunch of white guys and girls from the suburbs who did all we could to go into this neighborhood and be part of their world and befriend them and share the gospel with them and try our best not to look foolish on the basketball court. I was quickly given a nickname due to my lack of ability in basketball. I will not share that nickname with you, but yes, I would, I, my job was basically to take the ball after it had gone through our basket, stand on the baseline and give it to the guys. <laughs> and then just stand there and watch them go. Now Steve was one of the young men who came on Monday nights to the Tyndale Community Center in Little Burgundy, and he was different than most of the other guys. He didn't swear, he was respectful. A few nights he even brought his Bible to, to use during our talk time, and we came to realize that Steve came from a Christian home and that he himself was a believer. And over the years, we as leaders spent time with Steve, and, and as he got older, we, we put him into leadership positions, especially with our, with our little kids program. I lost touch with Steve, but found out later that, that he'd gone to Bible college in Rhode Island. And he worked for many years as a camp counselor at Camp Livingstone in, in the eastern townships of Quebec, where we used to send our kids from Little Burgundy to go to, and have a Christian camp experience. Steve married and, and had kids and moved to Ontario and got involved in various ministries. And, and we found each other on Facebook a few years ago. And last June, I asked Steve if he'd be willing to have a video call and help me un understand his perspective on what was happening in the world. We must have talked for over three hours. We caught up with each other. We shared just what's going on in our lives. We shared all kinds of memories from Little Burgundy, and for the most part, we laughed. <laughs> and back then, maybe we weren't laughing so much, but in hindsight, it was funny. We talked about his experiences as a black man married to a white woman, his experiences as a black English kid growing up in white French Montreal. He explained to me why the phrase, all lives matter, while completely true and usually quite harmless and innocuous, was a phrase that right now is very loaded and can be hurtful. And throughout our conversation, Steve's gentle spirit and his love for Jesus shone through. And he said, you know, a few people have reached out to me like you're doing. And so he, he planned, he told me he planned to make a short video that he would put on his Facebook page to share his feelings with everyone. So a few days later, this 10-minute video popped up on Steve's Facebook page with Steve sitting on his porch. He lived out in, lives out in the country, um, past Oakville, I think it is. It was so powerful that I shared it on my Facebook page so my friends could see it. And his main message, he said it was for the church in particular, but I think it was applicable to everybody. And his main message was this, please stop fighting. Please stop fighting. Every once in a while, either Steve or I would make a comment on each other's Facebook posts. Just last week, he commented on something I had said about the World Series that's going on. And Friday, I was scrolling through Facebook, and I saw something posted on Steve's Facebook page. At first, I didn't understand it. But as I continued reading, the shocking truth became clear. Steve died last Monday. His father-in-law said only that, that he had some sort of stomach ailment that took a horrible turn for the worse. 
Steve and Laura and Janet were all in their 40s. They had all left behind school age or university age children. All were devoted followers of Christ. All were actively involved in their local churches and other ministries. And it's only human to wonder why people so young, people so good, people so devoted to following Christ, people who were making a difference for Jesus had to die. So when I think of persevering through suffering, I can't begin to imagine how Nick and Jonathan and Steve's wife, Rachel, are making it through each day. Just putting one foot in front of the other, taking care of their families and their responsibilities in their churches. But as I read through the posts that each one made in social media, there's a common thread that passes through what they wrote, a common theme, a theme of hope, and it's something that can be summed up in one word, heaven. Although it is true, it can sound trite sometimes when we say it, when we who are not in the middle of grief and suffering and despair and talk about the hope of heaven. But, some, but when someone in the middle of that pain, when someone who has had half of their life ripped away from them is able to speak of the hope of the next life, to me that really says something. It speaks to the incredible peace and comfort that God gives in times of loss. It speaks to the hope that helps us persevere through mind-numbing suffering. It speaks of what gets us through and gives us expectant faith. Heaven. Here's what Nick wrote when his wife passed away. It is with great sadness I share my beloved Laura has gone home to glory. She peacefully passed into the hands of Jesus early this morning. Yesterday, I read to her many scriptures about our hope, which is anchored in the truth that Jesus, who called Laura long ago into his family, will never leave her nor forsake her. That even in death, we don't have to fear. Laura was not fearful. She told me she wanted to see Jesus. And at this moment, that is exactly what she is doing. And for that, I rejoice. For Nick and his family, there is sadness, there's pain, but there is no fear. There's even rejoicing in grief, for she is in the presence of Jesus. This is what Jonathan wrote. Friends and family, we are sad to let you know that Janet, my beautiful wife, Jake and Maddie's wonderful mother, passed away early this morning. Last night, we spent the most beautiful time singing and praying with her. As Janet wished and prayed, she went to be with Jesus while she was sleeping and woke up home. For Jonathan and his family, there is sadness, but there is confidence that Janet's journey was not a journey into the dark unknown, but rather it was a journey home. Now, to counteract the negativity that Steve was seeing all over the place in social media, he decided to do what he called Faith-Filled Friday. And every Friday, he would post something positive and encouraging, either words or pictures, something that was full of faith, something that would be encouraging to his readers, to his friends and his family. And it was this past Friday that I came across Steve's latest installment of Faith-Filled Friday. Now, he had died last Monday. And I hadn't heard about Steve's death at this point, so I think you'll understand why at first I was rather confused as I read this post. It's time for another Faith-Filled Friday installment. Wow. So much has changed in a week, hasn't it? I hear the weather is pretty good where you all are today, but I have to say, where I am now, it's glorious. Tomorrow's forecast looks pretty much the same, actually. I first want to extend my sincere apologies to family and friends. I didn't see this coming at all. Well, maybe in 20 or 30 years, but, but who really knows the number of our days but our Heavenly Father? I am just so grateful to be on this side of eternity with my Jesus now. It's everything I had ever dreamed of and so much more. The love in this place, wow. 
So I get there, and first thing he says is, well done, Steve-o, well done. Enter into the joy of your master. Okay, maybe he didn't say Steve-o. Well done? I could hardly believe it. I mean, I'd been stumbling along, just trying to do my best, and yet failing so often. Didn't he remember all the times I blew it? Well, apparently not. I felt so loved. If I ever doubted it before, and that was often, I will never doubt it again. So guys, let me tell you this. You are completely loved today. He's wanting you to know this today. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his only son, 1 John 4 and 10. I don't know if his wife or a friend wrote this in Steve's voice, or if Steve, knowing the gravity of his illness, wrote this before he died for later publication. All I know is that if I understand the scriptures properly, everything he wrote there is reality. He and Laura and Janet are all living in complete love enveloped completely in the love of Jesus, experiencing in full what we only have a taste of here in this life. And considering how amazing that taste is, it boggles the mind to think what heaven is really like. But heaven is a reality. In heaven, we will be more real than we've ever been in this life. And it's the truth and the hope of this reality that is giving Nick and Jonathan and Rachel the strength that they need in order to put one foot in front of the other, the strength they need in order to persevere. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul writes these words, If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people to be most pitied. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If our hope is in this life alone, even if this is a life where we have walked with Christ, then Paul is saying that people should feel sorry for us. The fullness of our hope is in the resurrection of Christ. And in that resurrection, death has been defeated. The sting of death is gone. Yes, there is sadness. Yes, there is pain. But there's no defeat. Christ makes death something that the enemy means for evil and destruction. He takes death and he turns it into the gateway to real life, to life eternal with him. The sting is gone. I saw some pictures online this week that got me thinking about my grandfather. He took up beekeeping when he retired from the police force. Graham and I have had some really good beekeeping talks. When my grandfather passed away in 2000, I asked, could I, I asked if I could share the message at the funeral because even a few days before he passed away, really feeling that he was going to pass away, I remember waking up one Saturday morning and on the back of an envelope, jotting down a bunch of thoughts that turned out to be a funeral message. And this is the thought I kind of shared. See, we as a family all reacted differently to Grandpa's bees. My grandmother hated them, absolutely hated them, especially that winter when he decided to build a room in the basement where he had enough bees, he was going to winter his bees in the basement, in this room. And they didn't get out or around the house, but you could hear through the floor vents in the bathroom, just this constant buzzing, and it drove my grandmother nuts. I enjoyed working with my uncle and my grandfather in the shed where we, we extracted the honey. And even though the shed was hundreds of yards away from the hives and my grandfather had smoked out all the bees he could, there were still a couple of dozen bees or a few dozen bees who would follow their hives to the shed saying, hey, come back here with our home. And they would buzz around the shed the whole time while we were trying to extract the honey. And um, I, I enjoyed working there, but, but every hour I had to step outside and calm my nerves from all the buzzing going on. One time a bee flew right inside my glasses and buzzed around inside my eye didn't sting me or anything, never got stung, but it just, it unnerved me, and I couldn't stay in the, the shed for more than an hour at a time. My sister, on the other hand, got a bee caught in her long hair when she was about 10 or 11, and it stung her right on the top of the head. No flesh to, like, cushion the blow. It really, really hurt, and from that point onward, 
She wanted nothing to do with the bees. When we went and visited Nanny and Grandpa, she would get out of the car and right to the house. and wouldn't hang around outside at all. She had a horrible experience with bees, and she was afraid of them, afraid of their sting. But my grandfather, for him, getting stung didn't bother him. I remember one time watching him. His job in the process was to take a hot knife and to cut away the wax on the outside of each frame so that the honey could be extracted. And uh, I watched him, and he's doing his job, and all of a sudden he goes like that. He looks at his thumb, and he just keeps going. He got stung. It didn't bother him at all. He would tell us this story about one time working with a very angry, angry hive, and it stung him 50 times. I would have gotten out of the business after that. But getting stung was not a big deal for Grandpa because he knew what to do when it happened. He knew how to get the stinger out properly and how to treat the wound. He knew that it would hurt for a minute, but because he wasn't allergic to bee stings, he knew that it wouldn't cause him any real harm. The sting was nothing more than an annoyance. He had no fear. The sting was gone. When it comes to the sting of death, some of us are like my sister, absolutely petrified and wanting nothing to do with even thinking about it. Others are like me. We, we deal with it okay most of the time, but every once in a while we freak out and it really unnerves us. But I think God wants us to be like my grandfather. Yes, this thing hurts for a time, but when you know it's only temporary and you know what to, you know what to do about it, this thing is gone. When we identify with Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, when we know and believe that he suffered to pay the penalty for our sins, when we confess our sins and we claim his forgiveness, then the same thing that happened to Jesus in his death happens to us. Resurrection. New life in heaven where every tear will be wiped away. No more sting. No more pain. No more death. Perseverance through suffering comes, in large part, when we take an eternal perspective on our present suffering. Now, that doesn't mean we find ourselves a nice cabin in the woods somewhere and just think only of heaven and sit there and wait. Okay, God, I'm just going to sit here and wait till heaven comes. Jesus could have taken each and every one of us home to be with him the minute we became Christians. But he didn't because he still has work for us to do here. He leaves us here so that we can let others know that when it's time for them to die, and we all will one day, they can see it not as something to be feared, but as something with no sting. They can see it like Nick and Laura and Jonathan and Janet and Steve and Rachel see it. See it as going home. And when we see it like that, it helps get us through. Because we know that this life is not all there is. There's so much more. It's hard sometimes to think of heaven when we're all tied up in the cares of this world. Sometimes we, we even hesitate to focus too much on heaven for fear of thinking that we're just using it as an escape mechanism from, from our troubles. But God has provided for us to have a proper heavenly viewpoint on life, life now and life in eternity, that helps us put our trials and our difficulties and our sufferings into perspective and helps us to persevere and to get through. Paul writes to the Romans, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For Laura and Janet and Steve, their suffering is completely overshadowed by the light of Jesus' face. And for Nick and Jonathan and Rachel, they persevere. They persevere through their suffering knowing that their loved ones are at home, home with Jesus. And that for them and for all who believe in his name, there will come a day when his glory will be revealed in us and he will wipe every tear from our eyes. That is our strength. And that is our hope. For there will come a day. Watch the screen. Would you pray with me, please? 
with their heads bowed and eyes closed. I love that song not only for the message of it, but for the context. For that was from a special televised performance that took place a week after 9-11. As different musical artists shared their gift and Faith Hill wanted to remind people that in the midst of terrible tragedy, probably the worst tragedy that America had seen in a generation, there will come a day when sin will have no trace. Every knee will bow, sin will have no trace. And we will live in the light of the glory of his amazing grace. Take a moment this morning and allow the Lord to speak to you about heaven. To let you know and to reassure you about those in your family who have gone before in Christ, that they are home. To reassure you that in the midst of all the difficult times you're going through now, not to minimize them, but they will seem like nothing compared to the glory that awaits us. If you need the strength to persevere right now through whatever you're going through, let the reality and the truth of heaven, the reality and the truth that there will come a day when it's all, when it's all past, that the sting of death is no more, let that reality and truth give you hope, give you peace, give you strength to put one foot in front of the other when times are rough. Take a moment, just you and the Lord, make this message personal in your life. Father, it's so easy to see the trials and the struggles and the difficulties in our lives as huge and insurmountable. It's so easy to see them as, even if they're not huge, they hang on and they keep nagging at us and pulling us down. Lord, please give us an eternal perspective on the things we go through that our light and momentary afflictions are as nothing compared to the glory that awaits us. Thank you, Lord, for your promise. Thank you, Lord, for the hope that we have. Thank you, Lord, that, that all that we go through is fitting into your plan and into eternity. Help us, Lord, not to, to trade in the glory of forever for discouragement today. Lord, thank you for leaving us here, even in this world where there is illness and disease and trouble and difficulty and, and hatred. Thank you for leaving us here to be a light, to be your hands and feet. Help us, Lord, to be able to find ways to share the hope of heaven with others to be able to let them know that they don't have to worry and, and hope that they've done enough good things to get into heaven. Help us to let them know that by your grace they can be saved. And know the promise and the truth and the reality of a foretaste of heaven now and the fullness of heaven to come. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross for us, for rising from the dead. And in, in that, the sting of death is gone. Lord, remind us of that every day. Help us to live in the light of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. This, day as you go, this week, as you go through the normal routine of your week, may you have opportunity to hear the voice of the Lord reminding you that death has lost its sting and that there will come a day when there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more sin, and that we will rise with him. And may that hope and may that reality be part of what the Lord uses to help you Continue to put one foot in front of the other and to persevere through whatever it is that life is bringing you. So glad you came here this, this day. May God bless you. Feel free to visit in here.